Coming up next, the Bookening continues to discuss 1984. They're listening to you. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bookening. They're not listening to you. Or maybe they are. You can hold both those thoughts in your head. It's called double think. And it's something that you should do, or shouldn't do, depending on the context. That you should both believe and not believe, and that you should both be conscious, but not conscious of believing. Mm-hmm. Ignorance is Free- fr- freedom? Uh, no, what's, what's the slogan? Slavery is freedom. Slavery is freedom, ignorance is... Bliss. Power. <laughs> Power. Strength. Strength. Ignorance and is war strength. is peace. And war is peace. Yeah. Yeah. War is peace. Slavery is freedom. Ignorance is strength. Yeah. God is power. Two plus two equals five. Never let me go, Jack. Never let me go. This is where we first met. My name is Nathan. I'm your humble and obedient host. Am I big brother? Yes. That makes Brandon. Ginormous brother? Ginormous brother. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. <laughs> I was just going to leave you. Oh, I made it into a fill in the blank. Yeah. And you filled in a big fat blank there. Uh, <laughs> it, it's Brandon Chastain. He's a scholar who's a baller of, uh, uh, oh boy, reading there you books. Go. And we've got the pastor who's a master of bleeding. Yep. It's definitely still Halloween. <laughs> We're not two weeks past the month of October. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, guys, this election cycle. Come on. That's right. We have a new president now, don't we? Do yeah. We? Do we? Well, we might not. It might still be caught up in the courts. And we might be on fire right now. I'm just going to stay in my house until we have a new president. It might take a year or two, but, you know. They're going to be fighting this out. Proud boys, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> stand by. Stand by. Proud stand back. <laughs> stand by and stand back. Wow. <laughs> Guys, uh, I guess we should admit we're recording this before. The election results. So. But after the first debate. But after after the first debate, yes. Yeah. So. You figure out where in history that is. Yeah. Uh, President Trump just got coronavirus. That's yeah. when we're recording this. Yeah. He went to the hospital today. So maybe you're living in, under the Pence monarchy or who knows what you're living in Yes, right the now. Pence mar- monarchy. That's what <laughs> Mike Pence would do. The pence Something terrible happened to... Donald Trump is declare himself king. <laughs> <laughs> I am now King Pence. King Pence. <laughs> good King Pence. <laughs> good King Pence loss. Yeah, good King Pence loss went out. It's more like Kingpin. King Pence. Uh, King Pence. The important thing is we're getting to 1984 quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike the last <laughs> Unlike episode. Unlike this episode. We're going to do all kinds of things we're, today. We're gonna, I'm going to give my three thoughts that I promised, mm-hmm. which I promised last time. Brandon, you're going to read... From some Orwell essays. Then we're going to give our baggage and we're going to start uh, tearing into this beast. This beast of this a book. This beast of a book. This beastly meaty book. Though they stab it with their steely knives, they just can't kill the beast. There's some great mm. poetry from you. A song that never that gets be, old. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you had a book that like, when you're done with the page, you could just eat it. And it was just like wonderful meat. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, wow. something, that's something you would <laughs> fantasize about. <laughs> Brandon, you're going to read us some essays. Yeah, I figured it might be fun to just hear his essay style. Yeah. So I have one from 1938, why I joined the ILP, which is the Labor Party, Mm -hmm. which is when he was saying why he became a socialist. So this is from the new leader from June 24th, 1938. Perhaps we'll be frankest to approach it first all from the personal angle. I'm a writer. The impulse of every writer is to keep out of politics. What he wants is to be left alone so that he can go on writing books in peace. But unfortunately, it is becoming obvious that this ideal is no more practicable than that of the petty shopkeeper who hopes to preserve his independence in the teeth of the chain store. So in other words, he kind of agrees with me that his position as a writer is very much historically situated, Mm -hmm. that he can't just be anti-political anymore. To begin with, the era of free speech is closing down. The freedom of the press in Britain was always something of a fake, because in the last resort, money controls opinion. Still, so long as the legal right to say what you like exists... There are always loopholes for an unorthodox writer. For some years past, I have managed to make the capitalist class pay me several pounds a week for writing books against capitalism. (laughs) But I do not delude myself that this state of affairs is going to last forever. 
We have seen what happened to the freedom of the press in Italy and Germany, and it will happen here sooner or later. The time is coming, not next year, perhaps not for 10 or 20 years, but it is coming when every writer will have the choice of being silenced or of producing the dope that a privileged minority demands. I mean, you see that today to an extent with what our national journalists feel free to write and say. Mm -hmm. I have to struggle against that, just as I have got to struggle against castor oil, rubber truncheons, and concentration camps. And the only regime which, in the long run, will dare to permit freedom of speech is a socialist regime. If fascism triumphs, I am finished as a writer. That is to say, finished in my only effective capacity. That in itself would be a sufficient reason for joining a socialist party. I have put the personal aspect first, but obviously it is not the only one. All right, so the next one I wanted to just read from is his one against fascism. Because two things that he was about. One, so you can see that his big concern with his move to socialism, which we didn't necessarily talk about too much on the last context, so this is just kind of an extension of it, was this idea of the suppression of free speech. He had seen something happen with the way that Indian news was suppressed and affected because of his involvement with India. But yeah, so that had led to his just realization in general of the dangers of suppression of free speech. And so that led him to these thoughts, whether or not socialism was the actual answer. Well, I don't know if we would say that today, but he definitely thinks that socialism is the way to defend that. Mm-hmm. Which hopefully lets people see that what he meant by socialism, like you said last time, was not necessarily what we think of as socialism today. No, I mean, it was an experiment that hadn't necessarily been tried. These guys weren't all looking back on Stalinist socialism or China or any of the brutal 20th century regimes. They just had these ideas for a system. And um, a lot of them were caught up in the kind of revolutionary glamour of it all. You read even something like P.G. Woodhouse, you'll just see random comic caricatures of socialists, uh, leave it to Smith, you know, running around doing their crazy kind of kooky they're, they're almost portrayed in a Woodhouse novel like a hippie would be portrayed in, in a conservative novel of the 60s, you know, like yep. the way that in the early 20th century, Babbitt thought about his son who was kind of getting these enlightened ideas or it was just the thing that intellectuals liked to sit around and talk about. And there were labor parties forming. And uh, I mean, I'm not a history, I'm not an expert in the history of socialism, but you cannot think that what they're talking about when they talk about socialism in the early 20th century is the same thing as Stalinist yep. so, communism, or that that's what anyone was advocating for. Now you can argue that what they were advocating for was the thing that would ultimately lead to all that bad stuff, but you have to at least realize that they didn't know that. You want to read something they had on fascism? Sure. This is from the Tribune in 1944. And this is where he's dealing with a definition of what a fascist was, and this gives you some just political context as to, have you ever had the trouble of actually just understanding what a fascist was? Like, what did the fascists believe? Well, I understand that if uh, socialism and communism is to take leftist ideas to their horrific extreme, then fascism is to take right-wing ideas, and they sort of meet in the middle and become totalitarianism either way. Yeah, so he starts the essay out by saying, what is fascism? And then he gives a whole listing of different ways people look at fascism. And then he ends by saying, it will be seen that as used, the word fascism is almost entirely meaningless. In conversation, of course, it is used even more wildly than in print. I have heard it applied to farmers, shopkeepers, social credit, corporal punishment, fox hunting, bullfighting, the 1922 committee, the 1941 committee, Kipling, Gandhi, Jung K. Shek, homosexuality, priestly's broadcast, youth hostels, astrology, women, dogs, and I do not know what else. Fascist dogs. <laughs> um, yet underneath all this mess, there does lie a kind of buried meaning. To begin with, it is clear that there are very great differences, some of them easy to point out and not easy to explain away, between the regimes called fascist and those called democratic. Secondly, if fascist means in sympathy with Hitler, some of the accusations I have listed above are obviously very much more justified than others. Thirdly, even when people who recklessly fling the word fascist in every direction attach any rate emotional significance to it, by fascism they mean, roughly speaking, something cruel, unscrupulous, arrogant, obscurantist, anti-liberal, anti-working class. Except for the relatively small number of fascist sympathizers, almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascist. Fascism is also a political and economic system. Why, then, can we not have a generally accepted definition of it? Alas, we shall not get one. Not yet, anyhow. To say why it would take too long, but basically it is because it is impossible to define fascism satisfactorily without making admissions which neither the fascists themselves, nor the conservatives, nor socialists of any color are willing to make. 
All one can do for the moment is to use the word with a certain amount of circumspection and not, as is usually done, degrade it to the level of a swear word. So anyways, so there's some of his politics regarding fascism. And I think also just, it's interesting to think of, at the time, fascism, I think, kind of fulfilled the political idea that we now have with communism. Mm -hmm. In other words, it does kind of just have a swear word mentality to it. Like if you call someone a fascist, but really, it did, no one really fully understands what they mean when they say it. Right. Like communist could mean Cubist, Cuban communist, it could mean Russian communism. And those are very different things. Some kind of ideal pure communism that the world has never seen yet. Yeah. If we could only get there. If we could only get there, yeah. Mm -hmm. We're waiting on America to step up and finally assume her rightful place in history. As the true communist state. And I, mean, I think the world's been waiting for. Yeah. But we are an America. exceptional nation. Exactly. When we do something, it works out. Always. And so the world's been waiting for America to do communism right. Well, Bernie Sanders, let's get there. Um, I, just, I just want to underline Jake's point here. The point that Jake's making, folks, is that progressive, liberal, left-wing type people are some of the worst American exceptionalists, exceptionalists that you could ask to meet. Yeah. yeah. Because they think all these ideas that failed <laughs> everywhere else are going to just go just great here in the great U.S. of A. Because it's us. Rah, rah, Uncle Sam. Yep. NPR is going to lead the way. <laughs> They're going to be the voice of Big Brother in Newspeak. Mm -hmm. I'm oh. sorry if you don't like it when the book ending gets political. Not that anyone's ever said that, but I don't know how we're going to do a couple episodes on 1984 and not be a little political. We'll have to be somewhat political, but... So I thought those would be useful essays just to see the politics he was dealing with and the way he does it. So even when handling fascism, he was he was fighting against the politics of his time, but also, I guess, not as loud mouth as you would expect him to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also it just gives you a flavor for the kind of essay style that he had since he was also, and maybe even more prominently at the time, an essay writer. So yeah, and a good one. Yeah, a good one. Well, now I will say my three things. His essay on writing's good. Yeah, his essay, his essay on writing's, writing's great, yeah. yeah. Now I will give my three thoughts. These are three things that I teased last time that I wanted to add to the discussion, add to the context. So oh, you tease. <laughs> oh, you tease. Number one, Neil Gaiman had a very good introduction to Fahrenheit 451. I don't remember whether we discussed this back in the Fahrenheit 451 uh, episode. He also had a great introduction to Yeah, we did, because Dune. one of the things that we- Yes, he did did in talking about it was we all felt compelled to bring up his point of hey guys remember 60 years ago when this was written yeah this is a novel of the 1950s it's about a fireman who's married to a woman who is his housewife who stays home and goes and does his job and has a male boss there's just all before, kinds of cultural stuff that's <laughs> completely before 1950s. you before you start yeah making fun of it for being so wrong about history remember well, not okay. only you know, the, the context it was written, but who it was written for and everything else. Yeah, you have to understand it. As, you have to understand every novel not as being futuristic, no matter when it's set, but as being alternate present, ultimately. Like, it's a novel of the 1950s, what the 1950s would be like if we were burning books and we had mechanical hounds. Just like 1984, you can see the application I'm going to draw to this book. You don't even have to. Although I think Orwell, for all Brandon's grumpiness that I think we're expecting, got more things right. I think where Orwell got things right, he got them so right that they just don't even feel like all that interesting anymore. It's like watching Minority Report and the aesthetics of the way that we use our cell phones and everything are so that, that the only things that really stick out are the things that are stupid. Like the fact that to transfer a file, he has to pull it out of a thing and then move it manually and do all these fancy mm -hmm. flips with it and stuff. It's like, oh, well, Minority f Report sure missed the boat. I was like, no, it missed the boat on one thing out of 99 it, things. And then it, it did as much to shape the way that every user interface you've ever had over the last 20 years or 15 years or however long it's been since the movie mm -hmm. came out it has actually been shaped by m people saying, wow, that looks really cool. Yep. And you can't overstate, I mean, you can't overstate this, actually. You could easily overstate this. But... It's interesting to speculate about how much a work, even like 1984, is predictive or, you know, how much do fascist states actually intentionally shape themselves after the aesthetic and the ideas of 1984. Interesting question. There's no way to read the book without asking that question. <laughs> right. 
how many people have said, you know what, O'Brien gets it. Yeah. Or just like, let's have constant surveillance. Let's have big posters of faces. Like there's just the iconic quality of it all is something that he was either right about or he helped shape. So I don't know. I mean, I suppose we'll talk more about that as we go, but I think it's, it's interesting. Art creates reality. Art creates reality, man. And all art is useless as uh, Wilde says. Art Garfunkel added a lot to Simon and Garfunkel, I think. I think you're right. Now, point number two. Okay. Orwell died right after he wrote this novel, and he was very sick when he was writing it. You can read a Guardian essay, I think, about Orwell holding himself up in some Welsh cabin by the sea and desperately trying to get this done. His publisher putting a lot of pressure on him because Animal Farm had come out and made a splash, and they said, you got to get your next novel out. If you want to capitalize on this, if you want to grow your brand, man, grow your, grow your momentum. So Orwell is a perfectionist. He wants to get this right. He can't figure out how to do it. And he basically holds up and kills himself writing this novel. I don't know what that adds or subtracts to our understanding, but I think if you understand this as the last gasp of a dying man, it does tell you something maybe about how the novel ends and about what he's seeing, you know. That's depressing. Yeah, it is. Well, you said he only lived, what, uh, 1903 to 1947? The guy died young. 1950, yeah, he was 47. Uh, You're trying to take over context here, Nathan? Is that what you're trying to do? Well, you know, uh, if somebody falls down on the job, it's nice for somebody else to... (sighs) Yeah, you're right. I'm tired. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just happen to... I can't go on. You will go on. My heart will go on. Jack, this is where we first met. Was I supposed to say something? I don't remember. You were. And I don't remember, but I know that if you said it, I think I would get what I was supposed to say. Right. Jack. Oh, yeah, that's uh, I'm Flying or something like that. I'm Flying. I'm a King of the World. I'm King of the World. Yeah, that's what it is. I think he said I'm King of the World. Uh, I don't remember. I, I, think thought, I, say, I thought Jack. whatever it would trigger something, but no, nothing's going to say Jack, like I'm flying or something like that. Thought number three. <laughs> I believe I can fly. I can believe I fly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And then we had a discussion about Space Jam or something, as one does <laughs> when s- someone says I can fly. I would like to point out that the lyrics actually, if you listen to them, sound like I can fly. I believe I can fly, not I can fly. I believe I can fly. I can fly. Well, maybe it's a weird religion. Yeah. I believe I, <laughs> I, can, believe fly. I can fall. I believe I can fly. I have never uh, heard anything like that in my life. Just like Listening dirty deeds that. are done by the Dunder Chief, whoever he is. <laughs> <laughs> dirty <laughs> deeds, Dunder Chief. <laughs> <laughs> just like Joshua fought the Battle of Cherry Coke, just like the secret Asian man is doing his stuff. Anyway, thought number three. Oh, I just thought this was interesting. I saw, I saw this on Wikipedia. I won't claim to have gotten this from anywhere, but Wikipedia, in fact, I'll just read the Wikipedia section. I think people might enjoy it. In the essay section of his novel, 1985, Anthony Burgess states that Orwell got the idea for the name of Big Brother from advertising billboards for educational corresponding cor- correspondence courses from a company called Bennett's during World War II. The original posters show J.M. Bennett himself, a kindly-looking old man, offering guidance and support to would-be students with the phrase, Let me be your father. According to Burgess, after Bennett's death, his son took over the company and the posters were replaced with pictures of the son, who looked imposing and stern, with the text, Let me be your big brother. (laughs) (laughs) So, I just thought that was cool and kind of funny. That is funny. It's It's fun how these things things in an artist's life get repurposed you know generally how yeah how that happens it's like in that mo- moment that i hate in every music biopic where ray charles is like you I know just, what i'm gonna hit the road i'm just gonna hit the road and then he's like sad and he walks over to his piano and starts hit the road mm, jack, jack don't you come back that is, that is my least favorite moment in every one of those movies i always think it's so stupid like even if it happened that way it's unbelievable. Change it to something that's not that. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe it ever. It's usually even something cornier than that. It's like, uh, he gets mad. And so he pushes some random guy onto the road. Yeah. It's like, I'm sorry that I pushed you and you hit the road, son. What's your name? My name's Jack, sir. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I hate that moment. Hit the road, Jack. Hit the road, Jack. Hit the road, Jack. (laughs) Hit the road, Jack. That's got a nice ring to it. (laughs) Hit the road, Jack. Jack. Don't don't you come back. No more. No more? <laughs> no more. No more. Mr. Cash, I'm going to need you to walk on that line, please. <laughs> that line right there. <laughs> that kind of crap. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> of course, if that's how it happened. <laughs> oh, it's just my hound dog, Mr. Presley. <laughs> it ain't nothing but my hound dog. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, even if it, if it did happen that way, A, it never happened that way. B, if it did, change it, because it's cheesy. Hey, Elvis, I just wanted you to know that we heard your record down here at the prison. Yeah. And <laughs> everybody in the whole cell block was dancing. <laughs> to your jailhouse rock. <laughs> what? Hey, you stepped on my blue suede shoes, mister. <laughs> don't you, don't you step on my blue suede shoes. <laughs> Okay, I take I it back. We, we need to write this <laughs> Elvis biopic. This is awesome. I think so. <laughs> Everything is like, it's just like a, Every single a beautiful song mind. in Elvis is a, ooh, wah. <laughs> Someone was mad at him. <laughs> yeah. It was a beautiful mind moment yeah. and, like where he just starts remembering everything and it's coming back to him. <laughs> you broke my heart at this hotel. <laughs> Uh, well, Beautiful Mind has that that one, the one like kind of like that where- uh, I can shake an apple from an apple tree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I was uh, watching yeah. a bunch of birds in that one. Well, you can't shake me. You can't shake me. Uh, Beautiful Mind, it's like they're hitting on girls, and then he decides instead of hitting on the main girl, they're going to hit on the two. Oh, yeah. Side, and then all in that moment, he's discovered game theory or whatever, which I still yeah. don't understand what game theory is, but... I don't either. I think it has to do with games, all right? Yeah, probably. We know somebody who studies game theory for a living. We do know somebody who studies game theory for a living. All right, guys. I thought we would talk about... The things. I thought we would talk about the various things and rate Orwell's prophecy on a, you can give it a big brother, a medium brother, a little brother, or a no brother. Mm, no brother if, he was com- if his prophecy was completely off the mark. Big brother obviously means his prophecy was right on, man. You're making me want a value mill. A value mill? Yeah, like a supersized brother. <laughs> or I just want a regular sized brother. We should start a fast food restaurant called Big Brother. We really should. Big burgers. We can have cameras everywhere. Yeah. Fish's big brother. Yeah. Instead of Fish's big boy. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> big boy. <laughs> oh, man, the big Nathan's, boy industry. Nathan's big burgers. <laughs> I don't care for that at all. <laughs> I'm not a fan of Nathan's big burgers. <laughs> don't like to imagine what it is and what that stands for. <laughs> Historical negationism was Orwell. On the mark about this. We will eventually, I think yes. probably in next episode, talk about the, the, novel. the, the novel itself. But I want to talk about the things that, the, the, big, <laughs> the big ideas from the novel. Was yeah. he, He's right on the money and moving more and more right every day. And I think it is bizarre to me. You would think it would be one of the more outlandish things from the novel. Yeah. Well, five years ago, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, certainly 15 years ago, I mean- Orwell looks like an idiot mm-hmm. to me. Yeah. In terms of, and it, you know, that whole, uh, not Marshall McLuhan, what's the other guy's name? Not Marshall McLuhan. Oh, um, or Neil Postman? Postman, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Postman's whole thing about Huxley beats out Orwell. Huxley was right. Orwell was wrong. Like, can you explain in case somebody, uh, listener, doesn't know who Postman was? Neil Postman wrote a book called Amusing Ourselves to Death. The premise of that book is that Huxley. Huxley's dystopian vision was right. Orwell's was wrong. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally wrong. Where we drug ourselves and all that. Yeah. uh, Huxley's Brave New World, we, you know, we just take... Free love, lots of sex, lots of drugs. Yeah, lots of sex, lots of drugs, and contraception, and... And our TV does the same thing to us. that, That morally degrades society and then creates a place where everybody's happy to be oppressed just so long as we can get our sex and drugs. Um, we don't actually need this cold brand of totalitarian fascism like that's holding people down because they'll we, hold themselves down. They'll if, hold themselves down if you just give them bread and circuses, basically. Yeah. And Postman sa- had been saying, you know, that's the direction we've been headed for a long time. You know, the news is not news, it's infotainment. You know, everything is entertainment. And all we want is our dopamine hits. Moment by moment, day to day. Postman, by the way, writing in either 83 or 85. It's 85. Yeah. Postman's writing it in 85. And he's saying it's all, basically he's saying it's all the dopamine hits. And we're, all, we're moving away from a society of people that is capable of critical thinking, that's capable of discerning truth, that's capable of even having an argument. Because all we want to do is be entertained. Mm-hmm. And what that's what we demand. Ronald Reagan was just elected president in 1984. 
right? And he's an actor. And he's an actor. And the TV has changed even the way that we approach politics. We want somebody who looks good on camera. Nixon lost to Kennedy mm-hmm. because Kennedy looked good on camera. You know, he, and he's writing back in that context. He says, th- this is just the future. So anyhow, all of that as sort of bigger context to say, I would have been right there with Postman in that analysis 5, 10, 15 years ago. But what you didn't realize, I mean, even going through this sort of fascist 1984 environment of a secular liberal state university education. Mm-hmm. It was about as close to pure Orwellianism as you can Yeah, get. Where, where you're literally, you have classes handing you sheets of words that you can't use. Mm-hmm. or pronouns that you can't use. You're going to be marked off for the pronouns that you use on your papers and stuff like that. Wow. Be, like, And that, that literally happened to me in college, right? So, but even that just felt like, okay, you, you're trying to create your little fascist communist bubble, but outside these walls... No one's going to take this seriously. No one's going to take it all that seriously. To the place where now, things just day by day feel more and more Orwellian to me. Mm-hmm. So yeah, now we live in a in a cancel culture where, what what was the word that you what was the what are we actually talking about? Historical uh, negation. Histor- <laughs> historical negation. It's absolutely a thing that is one hundred percent happening, and what people are calling for. Well, with they praise, s- I keep thinking about Hamilton. In, t- in thinking about nineteen eighty four, I was thinking about Hamilton and the fact that what was that article? I think we talked about it on Sound of Sanity, or at least on a Sanity Bites or something. It was like a. I don't remember what the publication was, but it was arguing that Hamilton needs to rewrite history. It's historical fiction, oh, and yeah. so it should be. It's, it's, a, it's historical appropriation, and, and so it should be. We need to appropriate history, and we need to change it. We need to make it what we want it to be. I mean, yeah. he, he's very explicitly arguing for something that- We need to make a new America, and that new America needs it's a new cultural history- and a cultural history that fits and justifies and validates the new America that we want to create. Mm-hmm. We need a a way to look at the founding of America as this pro-immigrant, multicultural thing. Right. And he's playing uh, in the article that I'm re- referencing, he's playing a little bit of a shell game because he's saying, you know, the, the, the assumption that you're supposed to take away from it is, of course, the real facts will always be out there somewhere. We're just not going to use them or popularize them or have them inform our discourse at all. We want different <laughs> yeah. facts to inform our discourse. Non-facts. Yeah. Uh, non-facts. We, want our, we want our own constructed narrative to do that. And that's just what is happening in mass right now, where we either have to rewrite history, pretend it doesn't exist, negate all the good of it, mm-hmm. whatever, and create a new history of some kind. Where I'm even talking to my daughter about this, you know, she's in this history unit at a private Christian school. It's almost like that the Native Americans are noble savages mm-hmm. kind of mindset. You yeah. know, it's like, guys, 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 we don't have to turn Native Americans into noble savages in order to not demonize them. Mm-hmm. Can we just have honest history, please? And she's 10, we don't need to know all the honest history. Right, we don't need to know all the details of how bad things were, but let's also not pretend like these civilizations were just a wonderful place that she would want to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, let's not pretend like the French and Indian Wars weren't horrific. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, or have you guys ever read? I don't remember what her name was. There was a woman that was captured by an Indian tribe, yeah. and she wrote a account Mary, of what happened. Mary, Mary something, yeah, and it is. I mean, we could have done that for Halloween week, right? I mean, it was yeah. it was just depraved, debauched, and as horrific as all get out. I mean, her account of the sexual debauchery and the callous bloodshed is is horrifying. And that's not to say that every Native American was that way, but it's ridiculous that I'm caught between a rock and hard place where I can only say they're noble savages or horrible monsters, and there's no there's no shades of gray. Mary Jamison, I think. I think that's right. Mary Jameson, captured by Indians, 1758, during the French and Indian Wars. Yeah. Well, I guess that would be the argument against this whole thing. If anybody wants, you know, it's easy for you guys as conservatives to say that pulling down statues and stuff is, uh, you know, historical negation, negationism and all this leaving, leading to some kind of totalitarian state. But 
actually the first version of history was just the winners deciding to paint everything their way. You guys are dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think what this what this article that I was referencing said, you know, obviously we'll always have the facts. Nobody's nobody's actually trying to say that con- the Confederacy didn't happen. We just don't need statues of it. Yeah, but it's it it is now more than statues. There's an attempt to rewrite and redefine history and it's widespread and it's more than pulling down statues. That's just something that people got excited about. Mm -hmm. The same teacher at a private Christian school in the Midwest has reshaped the entire reading curriculum for her class to include extensive numbers of books written by minorities and women. Mm -hmm. Let's fine. Let's have some good books written by minorities and women, but let's not cut out the canon in the process. Well, the thing I hate about that, uh, like it's, it's always depressing to lead, read the latest Norton anthologies because they'll always include more minorities and women. And it's like, I'm sorry, but whatever you think of minorities and women, they did not actually help shape whatever discourse we're talking about right now. Yeah. They, 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 Let's they, have books that are good, regardless of race, class, or culture. Mm-hmm. And let's have books, especially when we're talking about the shaping of Western civilization, let's have the actual books that shaped it. Right. Which were by and large written by white guys. And then let's, you know, if you want to talk about that, that's fine. But let's not be dishonest about the reality of how, of what was shaped and how and the goodness of it. Right. And still allow room for there to be, maybe acknowledge that, yeah, they weren't allowed to write as much. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, sure. Yeah, you'd be, you don't have you to be have happy to be, that they weren't allowed to write, write as much, but you can say, due to the fact that they didn't, they didn't actually produce a lot yeah. of memorable well, stuff. What you don't need to do is go scrape the bottom of the barrel <laughs> exactly. for the trash that... <laughs> and then make us read it. <laughs> and then make kids read it as if it's good. I had, some of, my wor- yeah. I had some of my worst university experiences with professors who wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. They just read garbage. Say, same thing. I had a professor who studied doing work on devotional poetry. Yeah. And so she's got Dunn and she's got Herbert, but she's having a hard time finding a a good female representative. Yeah. Of that time and that ca- ca- and so she's like got these examples, but it's like she's trying to stack these women that she can find scraps of poetry from. Yeah, here's some crazy next to Dunn and Herbert. Dunn. Yeah. Hmm. Like it's not flattering. Like you can't stack anybody next to Dunn and Herbert, let alone some scraps that you found. Yeah from the time period that happened to be from a woman, like, don't do that. You want to stack somebody next to Herbert and you want to stack a woman next to Herbert, fine. But you're going to have to leave that that time period mm-hmm. behind. Yeah. Like, and, and, and by the way- women, women weren't writing poetry and it wasn't being preserved. And women actually have one in certain fields too. Go study the 18th century novel. I mean, if that's what you really care about, you can make a good argument that George Eliot, Jane Austen- kind of perfected the novel, right? English novel writing. I mean, I, I, I think it'd be hard to argue against that personally. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, they're the best. Jane Austen is without peer. What, like, what kind of novel writing? I missed that word. Just English novel just writing. Just English novel writing, yeah. Who, who would what just, English novelist would you put, would you rate? Oh, English Jane? novelist, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, play plays, you got to give it to Shakespeare, right? But yeah. uh, if you want to say novel widespread, I'll give it to Tolstoy probably, but... English novelist. It's going to be Austin. I think even that broad of a category. Charles Dickens. <laughs> yeah, you, I mean, make that case, but still. At least we have a woman in the running. I mean, we can say yeah. that much. Um, well, and you have other women too. You have the Brontes. You have, you have the Brontes. You've got George, 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 Elliot. George, George yeah. Elliot, who certainly deserves to be in the conversation. Uh, Edith Wharton. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, it's not like women don't do good things. Let's just. And can't be gr- great writers. The, the best. <laughs> Let's just. Look for the Let's places. just not pretend that history didn't unfold the way it unfolded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also when you look at poetry in particular, it's a, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not go there. Bro. Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not go there. When you look at poetry, you realize that women aren't good at it, don't understand it. It's just not a feminine form and all the poems that are written by women suck. <laughs> That's what Brandon wanted to say. Yeah. And truly believes in his heart of hearts. That's what I truly believe in my heart of hearts, probably. Well, I was just I like thinking. Ann Sexton. 
I was just thinking, yeah, you have some good ones, but you also have like, I like Antarctica. I think too. it has also to do with like the musical instinct. Cause mm-hmm. if you look at like cl- history, of classical music and stuff, name, name one of the great composers. Uh, uh, Janis Joplin. Yeah. I don't know. There's probably something to unwind there, but that's not, has nothing to do with this episode. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> Anyways. Yeah. So yes, he was spot on with his history negationism historical negationism i believe is what they call it yeah and you also have like i listen to a lot of podcasts when i drive and like npr was over the other day praising like what's going over in bristol england with them pulling down statues and stuff mm-hmm. so it's happening everywhere <clears throat> the idea is to just you can erase the past and therefore make the present better mm-hmm. well the part whoever of it the- controls the past controls the present brandon mm-hmm. and whoever controls the present controls that's right. And that's they know that. They try to gussy it up with images of that they're doing the the people who've never had a voice a favor. Mm-hmm. But I mean where Orwell feels over the top is the fact that there's a ministry dedicated to it. The fact that they're being so blatant about it. Nobody today would be that blatant. You tell yourself. But then suddenly you see somebody being exactly that blatant. I mean, literally on Twitter saying, you know, some professor or somebody somewhere saying that two plus two equal, equals four is a statement of white supremacy. Right. Which is, right. did we reference that on Mike? That's something that we just know. saw. Yeah. I will say the thing that actually felt the most prescient, prescient based on what's going on right now to me was all the hate week stuff yeah. and the minute of hate. I mean, me and Jake have talked about this ad nauseum across the larger Warhorn verse, but the idea of demonizing your opponent and then stirring up people's hatred towards that opponent, just creating scapegoats and punishing them without mercy as a way of for people to cathartically feel good about themselves and about the party. Yep. That is all you see. Black Lives it, Matter with... Well, uh, anything you see on social media is just... Just that. that. Yeah. It's just that. It's just people getting catharsis... As, as we write, as we record this, President Trump got sick yesterday. He got COVID, and people are talking about how they want him <laughs> to die. If I go on Twitter right now and I search trending topics, I'll just pick the top trending topic. It's a Saturday. It's college, so everything's dominated by college football, right? So a coach's name is now the top thing trending on Twitter, and it's. I don't know how this coach has a head job. Fire him. They're getting things I can't say happen. Blah, blah, blah. I mean, like, it's just like, it's fan rage. Yeah, it's just burn this. It's just fan rage. Burn this man mm-hmm. and his family to the ground. Because Why? Because they started out 0-2. Right. On uh, the season. Wow. And it's SEC football. Right. And, and, and that's just like, that's pretty tame. Like, <clears throat> all things considered. Because it's just football. But even there, it's like we live in a culture where people think it's okay to throw a two-year-old supermarket tantrum as adults anywhere. I mean, we all like to make fun of the memes of like a feminist crying because Trump was elected. You know, people like to repost those things and make fun of them. But it really is ridiculous that... Chris Christie was diagnosed today with COVID. It's nasty what people are saying. About Chris Christie? Yeah. I mean, some of it's just jokes, like, because Chris Christie's fat. So it's things like COVID saw Chris Christie and was like, okay, sure, supersize it, (laughs) you know, stuff like that. Well, he's actually probably in legitimate risk because of his fatness. And the same thing, people listening don't need me to- Read all the Trump- uh, To read anything off of Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. All I have to do is open up their social media feeds and they're going to see family members that they- if it wasn't for their phones and social media, they would talk to once every three years at a family reunion mm-hmm. in fights with one another over masks, over Trump, over Biden, over... It just doesn't matter. Two minutes of hate. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, not to be too heavy handed, but we just got done with the first presidential debate as we record this. And it's just like, let's have two guys stand there and make yeah, each other you. see who can make the other one look like the bigger monster. That's that's all it is. We're not going to have an interesting exchange of ideas here. Yeah, there's no debate. There hasn't been a debate, though. 
for years. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's not. It's but not yeah. nothing new to Trump and Biden. They're just the most cartoonish version version of it. Of it the most and, and things just keep getting more and more cartoonish. Right. It's the state of the world that we live in. You just have to keep. You know, everything gets is getting louder and simpler and stupider. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels yeah. like. Yeah, actually, one of the only pages I flagged was this one. In a way, the worldview of the party imposed itself most successfully on people incapable of understanding it. They could be made to accept the most flagrant violations of reality because they never fully grasped the enormity of what was demanded of them and were not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what was happening. By lack of understanding, they remained sane. They simply swallowed everything. And what they swallowed did them no harm because it left no residue behind. So in other words, this is just people accept whatever party they're part of and they're just allowed, they get angry at what that party tells them to get angry at. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. And they really do flip. Yeah. They're not sufficiently, how did that thing go? They're not sufficiently informed. Yeah. We're all mad because we can't force our Supreme Court justice they're through quickly. They're and then incapable we're of understanding mad because it. the other people aren't. Exactly. And, you know, the difference is four years, mm -hmm. right? And it's just, it just doesn't matter. And, and there are people on the internet that, you know, are always trying to point this stuff out. You know, they'll line up a quote from President Obama mm -hmm. with a quote from Donald Trump. And well, that's like putting one brick up against a tsunami or something like that. Like, well, sometimes, sometimes the quote will be almost the same, right? Yeah, yeah. Coming out of my guy's mouth. It's great coming out of their guy's mouth. It's awful. Mm -hmm. It's awful. And it works both ways, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, so, so they're incapable of understanding any like big ideas. Or having any real principles. Mm -hmm. or, yeah. It's just we take whatever principles the party demands of us, largely based on. So what I've noticed is a lot of like liberals and people that I went to grad school with is not so much that they care about anything that they're being told to care about. It's just that they care about the appearance and the feeling of the party they've chosen to be a part of. Mm -hmm. Right. So they want to have the liberal, I keep picking on NPR, but it's a, I've listened to it quite a bit lately. The mm -hmm. NPR aesthetic, they want that mentality. It, it seems intelligent. It it's seems what, it's the well considered. It's what validates them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And what makes <clears throat> them feel validated. And some of it has to do with aesthetics and some of it has to do with. Um, Watery principles in their mind that they don't fully feel prepared to defend. Yep. Uh, and by the way, it's and not just our leaders don't either. Because... It has to do with regional bias mm -hmm. yeah. or uh, or regional anti bias, if I could say it, say it that way. Self, either I, either hometown pride or self loathing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you um, definitely when you're driving like in the cornfields of Illinois, you come to a little small town. Everybody there supports Trump, not because they had no, have any clue about his policies, but just because that's what you do. He, he feels like their guy mm -hmm. right yeah and if you're from that small town in illinois and you hate it and you hate your parents and everybody there you might be a dissident who yeah. is trying to pretend like he's as sophisticated as a coastal elite mm -hmm. right and imagines himself standing above the people around him yeah you know and maybe it's vice versa in other places but that's just the kind of like it's not about what these people actually believe it's about even down to the, like, I went to grad school with this one kid who came from small town America. His family was the only liberal family in, in Tutopolis, right next to Effingham, Illinois. You know, he was always like proud that his family was a liberal family. We all out, went out to his house one day. Come to find out, like, his dad was a, like a prominent head of government mm -hmm. out there doing stuff with the agricultural department. Like their family is the type that since they were in a certain position, the community looked at them as the type of people that were rich enough. And in the right sort of job that they got a pass to be the liberals, right? They were never yeah. going to get any flack for it. Yeah. So they mm -hmm. filled that role. My most recent annoyance with, with this was on the right, actually. I was reading a conservative pundit, well, a Christian, a Christian fundamentalist pundit who kept saying the word patriarchal. And, and I remember the, the day that I became a patriarchist and I, I became a patriarch and this and patriarch this and patriarch that. And I was like, why? Does this bug me? What is wrong with this? What is so annoying? And I finally realized it was just the pride that was coming off of this man and the way that he was validating his followers. You know, yeah. just like this is pandering. This is pandering. Yeah. If if he really wanted to help people, he'd say, "Ah, eh, you know, love your wife, go to church. Here's how you do it." Ba -da 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 -da. But instead, he's using these words that feel make people feel plugged into this worldview, make that said worldview feel really exciting and big. big. And I mean, and, the, and lust, the lust for things to feel big 
just drives me bonkers. Mm-hmm. Me and too. it's driving me more and more crazy. Well, if, if I can be really honest, we've been doing Warhorn Media for a while. We've been doing things like the booking for a while. You are planning a church right now, and yeah. I am joining you in this endeavor. It's really hard to operate in those spaces when people demand constant validation, when they demand to be connected to something big. It's like, and it is that demand. Mm-hmm. Like, it is people will literally look me in the face and say, I would love to come to your church. I'm going to come to your church once you get big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it, it Here's they, they, they don't say the words once you get big, but it is. <sighs> but what they will say is once you have a service, a building, a location, enough programs to service my family. Uh, so how do you think of that? I want to be at your church when that happens. Let me know. No, we won't. I'm let planning you know. to come. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, once you get there, I'm all in. No, you're not all in unless you're all in. Right. Do you believe in what we're doing <laughs> or not? <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to be real honest here. It's one of the reasons, it's one of the things I, I don't, my, some people just don't like the booking because they just don't like the booking, but, which is fine. Not everybody's has to enjoy the same flavor of ice cream, whatever. But when people don't like us because they feel not validated by us. I just, that really bugs me because why do you, why would you want to just listen to somebody that just validates the ideas that you already had? Isn't it more interesting? Isn't it more provoking? Isn't it more stimulating to your intelligence? And on a very basic level, isn't it more entertaining to hear us say thoughts that maybe are different from the thoughts that you've thought before? Yeah. And for a lot, not for everybody, but for a large swath of people, the answer to that question is no. Well, I I was just talking yesterday with a pastor, former pastor who lives in Evansville and I works, actually he works with uh, Epic Software for a, a hospital. So if you know anybody that works with like Epic Software, maybe lives up in Wisconsin and is familiar with that system, but maybe wants to leave. Mm-hmm. I might have, you know, somebody who has an in yeah. to okay. job situation like that. Anyhow, so he planted this church and then he transitioned to becoming, and this was always his plan. So he says, he transitioned to becoming uh, a ruling elder of this church. And he's just over the last couple of months become awakened to the reality that he had always thought that he was trying and with his people, he was trying to build a, a, a community where people could argue and disagree and whatever. And then he realized there's nobody believes in the idea that there, that unity and disagreement are not like on a Venn diagram, mm-hmm. perfectly aligned circles. There can be no unity where there's disagreement. So you're either all in or you're all out and nothing can be held in tension. I guess I better divorce my wife. When we talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about both the divorce rates and we talked about the standard for families to have, uh, for marriages to have zero fights and zero arguments and the pride that people take in being able to say that my wife and I have never had a fight or we've never raised our voices with each other. Or my business committee or my elders board or my whatever. Exactly. Exactly. And so, I don't know, it was a really interesting conversation. I really liked the guy a lot. He's sort of just coming awake to the reality of whatever I thought we had, whatever we thought we had in terms of being able to deal with and work with conflict, with conflict and through conflict, we didn't have it. There's just nothing here but absolute commitment to avoid conflict at all costs. And what you find is we slowly just kept lopping off corners of the gospel and of scripture until we're at a place where we as a congregation were comfortable and we knew what we could talk about and what we couldn't talk about. Mm -hmm. And so we thought we had this great unity and actually there were just things that we decided to not ever talk about, but that's, that's normal, right? Like I don't have to have that conversation to know, like that's not a surprise. No, that's right. That's just what everybody does. Exactly. Just keep cutting words out of the dictionary and invent something called new speak. And Mm -hmm. well, Eventually, you won't have an, have concepts to disagree about. 
they'll have left. What I or you'll add stuff so that it can also like I'm thinking of the pronouns and all mm-hmm. that, that we deal with today. That's a form of newspeak. It's not the exact direction of newspeak, but you're adding it's proliferation, but it's still the same idea that by adding words that haven't existed before, you're allowing people to conform to the mentality of the day. That is, I mean, we do see newspeak. Well, I just saw a guy exactly on Twitter. Twitter's way. a wonderful place to find examples of, you know, people be... suffering from mental illness. Yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, examples of all kinds of stuff, but, uh, if you just want to take some more Orwellian pot shots, Twitter's a great place for it. A guy, I think a politician, maybe he wasn't, but he was apologizing for using the term tone deaf because it was ableist. And right, of course. He should not have said that he was tone deaf on an issue or something because that's to insult all the people who actually have to deal with real tone deafness or uh-huh. tone, uh, what would it be? Uh, tone hardness of hearing, tone. Tone, tone, tone hearing challenges. Tone differently abled. D- differently abled. Tonally, tonally differently able, abled. Tonally, I'm not even sure you can use the word differently abled. Tonally abled in a different yet valid and valuable way. Yeah, there you go. Success. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody likes to make fun of that kind of overly PC language. You know, I don't know anybody. I don't think there's anyone in my life that would say this, this tone deaf guy was doing the right thing maybe i can think of a few people i know that would say that i don't know the goal line keeps being moved you know yeah even though we're all sort of like that's silly it's like well that's the the silliness of today is the seriousness of tomorrow guys i think we're gonna have to come back and talk some more about all this stuff next week maybe actually talk about the novel 1984 a little bit Jake, you, you want to help us out with some great donor shout outs my friend oh boy do i ever let's do it all right Oh no, Jake just got evaporated again. Man. Just like in the last episode. He's got to quit doing this. Yeah, man. It's a good thing he's coming back from the nether realm that he's being evaporated to. Maybe he was taken by the thought police. He was probably taken by the, you know, that guy thinks a lot of interesting thoughts, let's say. He does. He probably deserved it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Old double speak, Jake. That's what we call him. Two plus two makes five. Two plus two makes five. If, if we learn nothing else from O'Brien, oh, yeah. it's that two plus two equals five. I always love it when my sci-fi, whatever you would classify this as, definitely not sci-fi. Mm-hmm. My uh, dystopian literature just makes easy blanket cliche statements about life. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody just like says, yes, that's very true what he's saying. Because I've been in situations where we all gnash our teeth and stamp our feet at the villains on the screen. <laughs> And then chant weirdly together. I can see this becoming true. Yeah, obviously, we all do that. Brandon's. <laughs> I'm getting out some of my anger at this book. <laughs> Venting his spleen, as they used to say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, patrons. Patreon.com forward slash the booking is the place you go. And you know what, folks? I'm just going to handle this one myself. Brandon's, he's sitting right there. He's here. Maybe just make some grunts and affirmative mm-hmm. noises so people know you're there we go. here during this time. Sounds good. So. Yeah, you go to patreon.com forward slash the booking yep. and you sign up and uh, you support us for the price of a cup of coffee. Or if you want to give us $10 a month, then we'll, you'll get a donor shout out like you're about to hear. If you want to give us more than that, there's varying levels of prizes. There's t-shirts. There's a signed book. That's the $50 level. Very popular. 100 bucks a month. You can actually choose a book that we will read. Yeah. So that's fun. All right. So let me shout out some donors really quickly. Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds. <laughs> the Artful Anthony Dodger. Little Anthony Cigar Store uh, in beautiful Auburn, Alabama. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous, yeah. It's huge. The Immortal Chelsea E, Jimmy Beeman, Little Annie Oakley, Lily of the Valley, Andrew and Esther, the lovebird, the Keith Master, David's Mighty Men, Trucking, John and Jill, and Little Baby Max, Jay and Katie, who are cold in love, cheese, and also see a solution, including the way of faces, fairy mother, Great Princess of Wonder and Happiness, Mother Beth, Constant Prime Adam, Jeremy the Dark, the Lord of Death, Nathan, not me, Maya, Ryan the Red Avenger, and to the Ladies of Justice, Danny the Dude, DJ Sammy G, Benny and Danny Tiberius, Eric and Catherine from Yon Window Breaks, Professor and Lady X, Lavender's Green, Dylan, Dylan, Lavender's Blue, Lavender's Green, Dylan, Dylan, I love you too, Noah Constrictor, Mara Cheap, the Fair and Fragrant Maiden Chloe, Anthony who's cold and hates life, liberty, and the pursuit of cheese, Jujutsu Jeffrey, the Texas Ranger, Rachel, Rachel, Rachel. Midnight Ninja Ellen, Queen Can Get It, Return of the Jedediah, Jay of Rack and Ruin, Timothy the Rider at Dawn, Eric and Kate the Camp Champ, Kings Who Are Warm Love Bees, Maddie, 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 Sweet Jamie Sunshine, Tyler the Keeper of Eternal Darkness, and Lord the Keeper of Eternal Life, Cold Steel Cody, Jacqueline the Librarian, Barbarian, John Bobadilla, Bomb Diggity, and Captain Tennille's Maid, Saxophone Alex, Eli the Scarlet Pillar, and the other Saxophone Alex, and Dubstep Danny, and Ryan the Terror of Texas, and Eric of the Cream and Crimson who are stuck in the cold. Please send cheese. 
Brandon and I did not speed that up or do anything special in the editing, right? No. That's, that was impressive. Yep. I should have been an auctioneer. You should have been. You know, I think I could actually do better than that. Yeah. Uh, not, not to brag, but maybe next time I'll try and do even better than that. Anything to say to the folks before we, we go, Brandon? Uh, no. Support us. We really love all of you and hope that you will show your love back to us by sacrificing like a cup of coffee and giving us five dollars mm-hmm. a month you listen why aren't you doing it already we know there are more of you out there <laughs> they have a, an angry <laughs> bitter rant <laughs> against our listeners <laughs> from brandon chastain big brother jake is always watching you but big brother jake is he expects your loyalty fun fact about jake anytime you turn on a screen jake is there jake lives fun fact his new address is 101 and if you don't give us your money, he's going to invite you to visit Room 101. Mm-hmm. They're here. Is that the thought police knocking on our door? Sure is. Little man, I have nothing to hide. <laughs> Me neither. Nathan did it! 